Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Climate Careers Chat of 2022. We are very happy to have you here. This is brought to you all by SLEA and SCOCO. And don't worry, you will know both of those terms very well by the end of the night. SLEA stands for Sustainable Leaders in Action. And we have a lot of volunteers here from SLEA. And SCOCO is Sustainable Contra Costa. That's kind of the parent group of SLEA. So by the end of tonight, you will get to know all of us very well. I am your co-moderator along with my other co-moderator, Evan. We have got some great things in store for you guys tonight. If you guys wanna fill out that poll, that's a great way to get started because that's super fun. And you can tell by the Climate Careers Chat logo design here that we've got some themes of fire and water. That is super fun. So Evan, would you like to introduce kind of what we've got here? Yeah, totally. So for the uh, for the agenda, um, just a brief overview of, oh yeah, those are also the, um, sorry, those are the uh, answers to the polls that you guys filled out, which uh, you guys can let us know in the chat how many you guys got right. And yeah, um, it's just sort of kicking this climate career chat off and to introduce you guys to the themes of tonight. So yeah, now we can go to the agenda. And so here's a brief overview of our agenda for today's climate careers chat. We will first introduce our panelists, then we will start out with Sarah Phillips's presentation. And next we'll have a quick break where the audience can stretch their legs, grab a snack or whatever they deem necessary. And then we will hear the presentation from Hannah Lopez. And finally, we'll, we will finish this off with our popular Q&A session and some final closing statements. That sounds great. That sounds like a lot of fun. All right. On the next slide we have, after the agenda, some more fun stuff. And there's those terms again. We've got SLEA, Sustainable Leaders in Action, and SCOCO, Sustainable Contra Costa. Back, I told you, you guys are gonna learn these really fast. There. We are all doing this in partnership with the Contra Costa Library, my personal favorite library, because it's where I live. And I get to check out a lot of books from there, which is fantastic. So we're gonna do some introductions now. You guys know me, I am Rachel Kimball. I am your moderator tonight, one of your co-moderators. I'm from Carondelet High School. I'm currently a sophomore and I am a volunteer with Sustainable Leaders in Action. Now, my co-moderator, Evan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Evan Lee. I'm a senior at Northgate High School, and I actually intend on pursuing environmental studies in the future at college. I have been a member of SLEA for around a year, and I actually joined because of a climate careers chat meeting uh, recommended to me by a friend, just like this. And I've been doing beach cleanups with my family for like as long as I can remember, uh, Coastal Cleanup Day, if you guys know what that is. And my free, in my free time, I love to play tennis. And if the intern would like to introduce herself, go for it. Thank you, Evan. Hi, everyone. My name is Mia, and I'm the current Climate Careers Chat intern for SLEA, also known as Sustainable Leaders in Action. On behalf of all of SLEA, I would like to say a big thank you to all of you for joining us tonight, and we are so excited to have you. Hello, everyone. My name is Eliana Betrez, and I'm the staff person from Sustainable Contra Costa who gets to work on this project um, with SLEA and with the library. Um, a little bit about Sustainable Contra Costa. We are a community of citizens, educators, innovators, and organizations working together for ecologically sustainable, economically vibrant, and socially just communities for all. Um, and to echo Mia's statement, thank you so much for coming tonight. And we are so excited um, for you all to see what we have in store. And now if we could transition to the next slide, um, we can get we can give a special welcome to um, one of our co-hosts for this event, the Contra Costa County Library, and we can give some claps for them in the chat. And here representing them is our fabulous librarian, Miss Jackie Higgins. We can talk about the library event. Hello, I'm Jackie. I'm a librarian in Antioch, and I'm so thrilled to be here with uh, Sustainable Contra Costa and SLEA, which is Sustainable Leaders in Action. The adult services crew at Contra Costa County Libraries is working on some really great programs for sustainability in 2022. I will get that word right by the end of 2022. And we will uh, hope that you will stay tuned for more information on our sustainability programs. All 
All right. And our amazing panelists, Sarah Phillips and Hannah Lopez, you guys, these two women are incredible. Sarah Phillips works with water. Hannah Lopez works with fire. We see that theme coming together. Yes, 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 we do. Absolutely. Our amazing, amazing panelists, Sarah Phillips and Hannah Lopez have joined us for this event. And we are extremely excited for you guys to hear all about them. But first, we are going to play a little game of two truths and a lie to get to know our first panelist, Sarah Phillips. All right, Sarah Phillips, the first of the two truths or lie, Sarah loves nothing more than being outside in the snow, shredding the slopes on a snowboard. Could that be the lie? We don't know. Is this the lie? At 20 years old, Sarah dropped a full scholarship, left her pickup truck and, and life behind in the deep south to follow her dreams to live out in California. Is that the lie? Pretty interesting. I don't know. How about this one? Sarah gets paid to electrocute endangered species in the water. Is that the lie? Is that a truth? We don't know. You guys got to pick one and then we'll see which one is the truth and which one is the lie. That's how two truths and a lie work. I think we know this. All right, this is very interesting. Mia, how much time do we have on this two truths and a lie? Um, I think we can give it a few more seconds and then I can show the lie. All right. I am very personally interested to see this because I know I've been given like a lot of prep but I have not seen the two truths and a lie answers. I have, this is the one thing I have not seen. All right, let's I think that's see. enough time. Ooh. All right, so we have all the answers here and turns out the lie is that Sarah loves nothing more than being outside in the snow, shredding the slopes on a snowboard. Sarah, you don't like that? Would you like to elaborate on this a little bit that you don't like shredding the slopes on a snowboard? <sighs> I, if you notice my hair blowing around in the breeze, it's because I'm in Costa Rica right now um, calling in. I am way more of a tropics person than I am the snow. Like looking at snow, I'll hang out with my friends, but I'll, I'll be the one tending to the fire and keeping a place warm. I'm not going to go and go out playing in the snow. It's not my cup of tea, but the rest are all true. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Well, leaving like a full scholarship at 20 years old, that's really cool. Would you like to talk about that more? Because that's insane. I want to hear about that. Yeah, I don't know if I would consider leaving a full scholarship really cool. Uh, in hindsight, you know, maybe it, it was an interesting decision that I made at the time. But I knew I wanted to be in California, and I knew that California had a lot of environmental science programs uh, at the universities, where at the time Georgia did not. And I also just really wanted to get out of the South and be in a different space. Um, so that was that story, but yeah, my truck, my dog, my full scholarship, everything, uh, just kind of left all of that back in Georgia and came out to California. And I've been out here now for almost 20 years. Um, it has been, it was just 18 years for my anniversary in December. And I'm sure everybody is really curious about electrocuting endangered species in the water. Um, I was hoping people were going to pick that as a lie because that just sounds absolutely ludicrous, but so I am permitted uh, through the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, for under their Section 10 permit for endangered species, where I am able to handle and work with and monitor endangered species, specifically endangered salmonids. So coho salmon, Chinook salmon, steelhead trout. And when we do juvenile surveying, that is one of the methods that we will use for gently tickling them. We're not frying them or anything. It gently tickles them. It sets off their equilibrium. So they tilt a little bit sideways in the water and we can see their underside and be able to net them very carefully and cautiously, put them in a bucket with water and an aerator. And that allows us to monitor them, to know their size, their weight, their species, and understand what the population is looking at, looking like for that life stage that year. 
Well, I think all of that is extremely cool. I mean, 20 years old following your dreams and now electrocuting fish to monitor them. That's really cool. All right. So I believe our next couple of slides is a presentation brought to you by Sarah Phillips. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate the introduction and just really want to give thanks for the invitation to be here to join everyone to share the pathways, many pathways that I have taken to get to where I'm at and just really inspired by the work that you all are doing and I know that you all are going to be leading the future and I, I feel really good about it, leaving uh, the future in y'all's hands. So um, with that, uh, who is going to be advancing my slides for me? I will. Okay, great. So I'll just say next slide when I'm ready, but um, we'll just great. pause here for a second. Thank you very much, Mia. So I just want to start with saying, you know, I want my intention of this presentation to resonate within everyone listening and inspiring you, even if it's only inspiring you a smidge, just hopefully it will inspire you to move in the direction of conservation and restoration and environmental work, because we des desperately need more people on this front and getting the work done. Uh, currently, I am the Urban Streams Program Manager for the Marin Resource Conservation District in Marin County. I've been there for seven and a half years. I've been in my career now for 12 years, and my story is one of many twists and turns, and I'd like to think that I've been very closely aligned with sympathizing with Goldilocks, trying to find my perfect fit. Uh, next slide, please. So as a kid, that's me on the left with that little smug face. Um, as a kid, I was always collecting fact cards on animals around the world. I was writing quote unquote books about dolphins and sea turtles, as well as writing poetry about the rainforest, which I'm calling in from the rainforest right now, oddly enough. Um, I wanted to be the Lorax when I, when I grew up. So I knew that I was really trying to follow and pursue a pathway of doing environmental conservation when I was at a, a very young age. When I was 18, I took an environmental science class at Kennesaw State University in the state of Georgia. And I had an epic professor that for me, he was just the best. He rode his skateboard to school. And I just, I was like, wow, talk about really cutting your carbon emissions. It was cutting edge at the time. Uh, that was back in like 2001. So at the time there weren't any environmental science degrees in the state of Georgia, except for Georgia Tech. And at the time I wasn't pursuing moving into downtown Atlanta and at about the time I was 20, just about to turn 21, I knew that I could find and pursue environmental science in California. So yeah, I had a full scholarship. I, I left that behind in Georgia. I packed up everything and, and I headed out west. And I wanted to run wild for a little bit since I was raised pretty conservatively in staying put. So the first two to three years, I lived quite nomadically as a little tumbleweed. I first landed in Nevada City. And since then I lived in South Lake Tahoe, Sonoma County, and like three or four, probably four different cities in Sonoma County now. Uh, I've also lived in Santa Cruz, uh, Nevada City again, and then went down to San Luis Obispo and Pismo and bounced back up to Sonoma County where I currently live. Um, I decided it was time after a few years that I needed to settle down and finish my degree. So I saw that Sonoma State University actually had a program in restoration and conservation. And that was in their environmental studies and planning program. Uh, and then I also minored in biology. At the time, it just seemed like a perfect fit because all of the classes were easy, they were really fun, and for me, it was just, you know, signifying I was on the right path. What was really great about Sonoma State also is that they required in that program that you complete two internships. So that really forces you to kind of get out of your comfort zone and plug into local community groups so that you can intern and get some experience. Next slide, please. So challenging times, right. I graduated in May, 2009, and this was in the aftermath of the recession in 2008. So bright-eyed, bushy-tailed Sarah was really excited with my resume and going out and on top of the world and graduating and having my degree, but nobody was hiring at the time, unfortunately, because of the recession, they were actually laying people off. Next slide, please. So in pursuing my childhood dreams, um, being jobless in the recession wasn't all that bad. It actually opened the door for me to an opportunity in Ecuador and to go down to the country of Ecuador and work there for a group called Co-Renewal. And I found that connection uh, by a fellow student that I met in my restoration ecology class. She had started 
a nonprofit in a certain area of Ecuador that was really focusing on, so there's a, a long legacy and still to this day, a legacy of oil pollution and oil pits and highly contaminated areas with crude, uh, crude oil. And so it left the local people unable to grow food anymore. So the work that we were focused on was remediation and it was micro remediation using mycelium, using mushrooms, there's bio remediation using certain bacteria to break down uh, the hydrocarbons. And also I was specifically interested in phyto remediation. So using plants to uptake and clean out the substrate or soil. Um, this was, uh, it was pretty fun because I was able to conduct my own studies while also teaching experimental design classes to students that came down to volunteer with us. This nonprofit also was working with teaching the indigenous communities through workshops, how to remediate the oil stricken lands with mycelium and with bacteria on their own land so they could do it themselves and be able to grow food again. I still serve on this board as a director, but I learned really quick how tough it is to actually work in the Amazon rainforest. It's, it's really challenging. So um, just for a little tidbit of informa information, co-renewal also now works in the Western United States in the post-catastrophic wildfire areas to address remediation efforts and healing the land, protecting water quality from toxic runoff, and working with affected fire, <clears throat> excuse me, with affected fire victims experiencing PTSD, as we also have a public health component to our mission, as well as social justice. So you can learn more checking us out online. Next slide, please. So AmeriCorps, I can't recommend checking out AmeriCorps programs enough. It's a great way to get your feet wet, get your foot in the door and really start learning. Um, and, and you take on a lot of responsibility in those positions and it's a great chance to grow. So upon my return from Ecuador, I started volunteering at an organization in Nevada City called CIRCLE, which stands for South Yuba River Citizens League, who then asked me to serve that nonprofit as their AmeriCorps member, as the watershed coordinator. I didn't even know what a watershed coordinator was at the time, but that ends up being the rest of my career, kind of in a nutshell. So I worked for Circle as an AmeriCorps member, providing endless opportunities for me to network and to be able to grow professionally. There are um, a few different programs within AmeriCorps. If you look into in California, there's the WSP, it's Watershed Stewards Program. And then I did the SNAP, which is Sierra Nevada Alliance Partnership Program. Next slide, please. So after my um, term at AmeriCorps, so it's a service term of 11 months, uh, after I did that, Circle hired me on as uh, their restoration director. Uh, they didn't have a restoration program yet, so I got that up and running since that was my degree and my background and my passion. And Circle, I really focused a lot on community engagement and education, public speaking, uh, donor event coordination, grant writing, uh, implementing projects, specifically uh, watershed projects like floodplain restoration, uh, project monitoring, serving as a naturalist on rafting tours, watching Chinook salmon spawning on the lower Yuba, and managing and mentoring the AmeriCorps members that came in subsequent years after me. I have to admit, if you join a smaller environmental nonprofit that's stretched really thin, it's a wonderful way to be able to learn how to do almost everything, but it's also high stress and not always the best pay, but you will learn how to do a lot. Um, through that time, I was then approached and asked to join a consulting firm as an independent contractor with funding from the Department of Water Resources doing integrated regional water management planning. And this was planning and implement, implementation grants for the Kasumnas, American Bear, and Yuba River watersheds. It made really good money, but it wasn't really engaging enough, although it taught me a lot about facilitation and mediation, which I highly recommend people um, dig into and take some classes around learning how to facilitate meetings and mediate different um, conflict situations, especially with environmental negotiation. Next slide, please. So here I am after that, I saw a job, it looked like a dream job is in 2013 with the Coastal San Luis Resource Conservation District that was down in Pismo. And it partnered with state parks doing dune restoration and revegetation. For me, this was a dream come true. It really addressed my desires to carry out coastal restoration, but you know, some things uh, just aren't as good as they seem. And it turns out that getting pelted in the face with sand all day every day isn't really a whole lot of fun. Neither is monitoring uh, for the Air Quality Control Board when you thought you were doing revegetation restoration projects. 
Um, so one day I saw U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out seining on the beach for steelhead fish, steelhead trout. And I felt this longing to return to moving waters and working with salmonids. So I became open to uh, offers for other jobs and I sent a job, oh, I was sent a job opportunity as an ombudsman uh, for Marin RCD with Marin County funding. So Marin County was contracting the RCD in Marin for this position. This is when I knew that this was my Goldilocks of jobs and that it would allow me to tap into my inner Lorax. Uh, next, please, next slide. So um, this is getting us caught up to date with where I'm at now. So Marin RCD, uh, I have done a little bit of everything within this job. I was actually supposed, I was hired to carry out uh, an ordinance, a stream protection ordinance called the Stream Conservation Area Ordinance, which requires a setback or a buffer from the top of the bank of a stream. And it creates this, this buffer, this area of like, thou shalt not do X, Y, Z. Um, apparently it was quite contentious then, it's still contentious now. It's been litigated for over 10 years. And as a result of that, I had already got contracted before another lawsuit was ensued. And so I, that was put on hold, but I was already hired. So then that allowed me to actually build my own program from scratch with the funding and with the contract that I already had in place. And what that allowed me to do was everything, all of my favorite things. So I really focused on helping people with regulatory compliance with the Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, specifically with local regulations, with state regulations and with federal regulations. I also help the regulatory agencies with their workload and create a really positive working relationship with them. Um, facilitating and mediating meetings is really big. I, I, again, can't suggest enough how important it is to get some training and understanding around that. Um, teaching, leading and coordinating and teaching hands-on technical training workshops around learning about water quality, rainwater, stormwater, uh, soil bioengineering, which is a fancy term for using plants to help reduce erosion. And not all erosion is bad. It's actually the fine sediment that's like mud that's getting into the water and that can actually suffocate salmonid eggs um, when it's spawning season. It can fill in the interstitial spaces between the rocks where the eggs are and um, it doesn't allow oxygen to actually pass through. So that's one of the things we look out for. Uh, larger erosion, larger sediment going in is great because that's actually what produces spawning gravels and how we actually get the geomorphology of a stream, um, which helps it function in a lot of ways that that's a whole nother presentation. So also uh, doing lecture series and creating site visits for homeowners that live along streams and helping them understand their property and teaching them about stewardship overall is a big part of my job, as well as grant writing which is my least favorite part of my job, but it's very important. And if you can get your foot in the door with grant writing, you will have a job for the rest of your life, I promise. <laughs> Next slide. And those photos are some from different workshops and presentations I've given. Um, so yeah, here's a great example of a grant that I wrote and got implemented as a project. It's a, a fish habitat uh, creation project that was about a quarter million dollars. And throughout this job, I was the project manager. I was the regulatory compliance inspector. I was the bio monitor. I was the construction manager. I think I already said that though. It was a little bit of everything. So it was really being on site nonstop managing the crews and watching the project. Um, also relocating endangered fish, which you see in the bottom right. The electrocuting fish is there on the bottom left. It looks like a little ghost, Ghostbusters backpack that I'm wearing. Um, and then in the middle is, you know, that's project management. I'm on site doing a little bit of everything while also still writing progress reports and tracking invoices. So that's been um, a really, really fun part of my job and keeps me on my toes. Uh, another part of my job is fisheries monitoring, which we talked about earlier with the two truths and a lie. I get contracted by water agencies and National Park Service to help them um, be able to carry out their monitoring efforts. So then we can know how on track are we with um, conservation efforts and building these habitat structures for improving populations of federally listed endangered coho salmon specifically. Um, what else would I say about this? 
I say also like a, a big part of my job is supporting partner agencies and all of the various watershed groups, as well as the departments that are Department of Public Works of all the towns um, and cities within Marin County. I work countywide um, and also leading creek cleanup events. So Evan, it was great hearing about your going every year to do the cleanup events because I too, that's just been my thing for so, so long. And usually I get to lead a site every year. So that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so like I said, I manage the program countywide by myself, so it really, really depends on me having positive working relationships and collaborating with others because I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do by myself, so I'm always, always, always collaborating. Um, and again, I'm always partnering with the AmeriCorps members that I find that are representing different agencies, so we get to have a win-win. I can have their help, and then they also get to learn and train with me. Next slide, please. So I really did end up with the Goldilocks job working at the Marin RCD. These, um, it's all women on staff and they're great. I mean, these are birthday cakes they've made for me over the years. One's a salmon, one's a beaver. Um, they're just, it's a really supportive, wonderful group and they spoil me rotten. And I just, I really love working there. And I never thought I'd be anywhere for so long because I, I love just jumping and learning new things all the time. But I really have my little niche created for me here in Marin. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so yeah, let's talk about barriers, adaptations, and joy. So as I mentioned earlier, I graduated during a recession, and that is just really challenging, but I overcame it by being willing to volunteer just so I could get my foot in the door and learning the organization at that point. That was when I was offered, <laughs> I was offered uh, a year service of AmeriCorps. It did not taste like salmon, by the way, for the comment that came in about the salmon cake. It was a delicious cake. It just looked like a salmon. It had glitter icing. Um, so yeah, landing my current job also seemed like a barrier due to the process and the caution exercised. Uh, it took me four months. I had to do three interviews uh, to get the job. I had a, a whole panel of interviewers like interrogating me. I knew that if I didn't get the job, it was gonna be okay, that it wasn't meant to be. And I knew if I got the job that I was confident because they knew that I could do it. And uh, they, they raked me over the coals. So I felt pretty confident when they offered me the job that I was in it to win it. Um, and what really got me the job was having broad experience, uh, technical skills as well, and studying in advance of of the interview. So I was reviewing a lot of different papers and assessments and studies that were already conducted in Marin about endangered salmonids and different research. Um, also talked and checked in with different stakeholders in Marin to just kind of get a feel for the partners I'd be working with and get any advice from them. And knowing that I would be doing regulatory work, I dug into all the local ordinances and tried to really understand what was already in place and, and where there could be room for improvement. Um, as far as adaptation, I'd say in, in my younger years, being an entry-level female in the field was a little challenging. And in overcoming that, I just I studied and I learned as much as possible so that I could have a voice and I knew what I was talking about. As well, I became a certified mediator and I've taken so many trainings around facilitation, which allows me the, the blessing and a curse of getting deemed like the chair of a lot of different age, of a lot of different meetings and technical advisory committees and, and groups. So setting the agenda, running the meeting, keeping the peace um, was all part of being a facilitator and a mediator as well. Um, building positive working relationships with the regulators to find support from them with permitting my projects as a project manager has been really big too and, and adapting to my position. Um, finally, as far as joys, before COVID, uh, I had a lot of joy seeing the light bulbs go off when I would teach hands-on technical trainings, doing field-time monitoring cell monitors, which I still get to do, thankfully, um, and then stepping back after completing a quarter million dollar large woody debris project to take it all in. Uh, that's really important. I saw that as the one of the quiz questions and large wood when it falls in, small wood, large wood. I mean, before people were around, that's just what happened. Trees fall in, you know, they, they only live so long, they live, they die, they fall. And when they're near a stream, they actually fall into the stream. And it adds more complexity, not only for the morphology of the stream, um, being able to create these nice scour pools on the downstream end, where in the summertime, when juvenile fish are rearing and they don't have a lot of places to go to, a deep, cool pool under some wood is great. They can hide out from predators, they're having cooler temperatures, which is absolutely life dependent for them. Uh, warmer temperatures can be lethal, as well as it allows, um, you know, just overall 
a nice cool place to hang out for the summertime. On the upstream end of, of wood jams, you also get a little bit of aggradation so the sediment can kind of build up. So again, you get that complexity, but you also have nutrient cycling and you have the wood breaking down, you have your benthic macroinvertebrates or your aquatic insects breaking that down, which are also fish food. Um, so overall, fish evolved with wood in the streams. It's really great whenever you can. Wood is good, leave the wood there in place. Um, it does get a little tricky in heavily residential areas where you have to just be really cautious about when it's okay to leave the wood there and make sure it's not a threat to infrastructure. Um, but we spend millions and millions of dollars in Marin County putting wood back in the creek for fish. You wouldn't believe it. Um, also, um, just wrapping up on the joy section is really working with frustrated landowners through and holding their hands through the regulatory process and helping design and guide their projects. Again, leading the creek cleanup events and working through hiccups with communication um, through just better communication and with education. And I say overall, my pathway has fulfilled my passion. Yes, wood is really good for the creek, Selma, just to answer your quick question there, um, really good. Overall, my pathway has fulfilled my passion into a multidisciplinary career that has led me to work in various sectors, including nonprofit, uh, private consulting, local government work, as well as state work and federal government work, as has the diverse experience in the various ecosystems I've worked in, from riverine, from high elevation meadow systems, doing aspen regeneration work, working in the dunes along the beaches, to working in the tropical rainforest in the Amazon, and now in the coastal redwoods. Next slide, please. So I highly, highly recommend AmeriCorps program and internships and submitting posters of your projects and things you're interested in at conservation conferences, much like the Salmonid Restoration Federation, SRF, as well as CIRCAL, which is Society for Ecological Restoration in California, to connect with them and to be able to learn from others that are there presenting their posters. Um, I, I can't say enough about being persistent stay motivated, stay hopeful, and remember how small the world is. So maintaining positive relationships is crucial. You will be running into each other over and over again, I promise. Uh, the biggest tip, my biggest tip for you is to dig in, try a little bit of everything as the field of conservation is way more vast than you could ever imagine, and be sure to network. Even if you feel awkward doing it, it'll feel less awkward over time. And maybe not, but who cares? It's still really important to connect and, and get, your, get yourself out there seek out any kind of certification. Wow, that's really interesting. That picture's upside down. Sorry about that, guys. Um, seek out certification programs, set a degree, get a degree or two or three, further education always. Take short courses to stay up to date as science is always evolving upon new data discovered and analyzed. And look for jobs that support their staff and uphold professional development so they can help cover the associated costs. Throw yourself out there and see where you land and then see where that landing takes you next. And in closing uh, with this awesome quote I love, tell me what it is you plan to do with this one wild and precious life. So continue your pursuit, live your dreams, don't settle until you found your happy place. Next slide. And thank you so very much everyone for having me. This is a great opportunity to, to check in and share my life and my path with all of you. And this is one of my large woody debris fish habitat projects and this one was a little less than a quarter million dollars, but this is somebody's backyard in West Marin, so not that far away. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was amazing. If we could get like a couple hand claps in the chat, that was fantastic, perfect presentation. So I am like still like reeling from all of that. I think we're gonna take a three minute break and come back and we're gonna have our next panelist go. All right, thank you very much, Sarah. Now, three minute break time. Hello, if you're staying by during the break, um, I was just going to tell you a little bit about Sustainable Leaders in Action. Um, I'm Alexi, the current chair of Sustainable Leaders in Action, which is, as stated previously, an environmental youth group of Contra Costa. Sustainable Leaders in Action produces climate ch careers chat like the one you're attending tonight. We also create our own bi-monthly newsletter, participate in actions of the month on, from the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge, teach children about sustainability through spy themes, summer programs, 
by oral and gastrolin and Contra Costa and more. If you're interested in joining or contacting Sustainable Leaders in Action, feel free to message me through the email displayed on the screen or in the chat. Enjoy your short break. Thanks, Alexi. And if we still have you here as well during your break, um, I'd like to talk to you all about the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge. Um, so this is a free online resource where you'll find practical solutions and local resources to help you save money, energy, water, and waste in your homes, your households. See how each action improves your carbon footprint and track your progress to make an impact on climate change. Um, as you can see, we've saved over a thousand tons of CO2 so far, which is awesome. And we are um, approaching our goal. We're about 70% there. Um, and we have over 2,300 um, homes registered for this. So that's amazing. Um, Okay, next slide, please. Like I mentioned, there are a lot of different actions um, and what we like to say is that there is an action for everyone. Um, so these are some examples of some of the actions. And as you can see, they have the, they will display um, the level of difficulty. Um, it'll give you the option to um, choose different actions. And then if you could click on it again, please. Hmm. There's supposed to be a transition in there. That's okay. Each action also includes um, some really amazing, amazing resources um, that are tied to your geographic location. Um, when you sign up, it takes less than a minute and it is really a great way to be able to monitor your own um, carbon footprint and just see what kinds of actions you can take or actions you already take in your household to save these resources. Um, you can also earn some really great prizes uh, by participating in the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge. Um, some of those prizes include a free yard of mulch, um, clipper cards and gift cards to various local businesses, which is amazing as well, because we have a lot throughout Contra Costa County. Um, so to, yes, um, to visit this site, you will go to cleanercontracosta.org. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me via chat um, or our Instagrams, which we will be sharing later. Um, and thank you all for listening. Awesome. Well, it looks like we're ready for our second and final presentation of the night. I will introduce Hannah Lopez. She is the Fire, fire Forward uh, Logistics Manager at Audubon Canyon Ranch. And whenever you're ready to start it up, you guys can launch the Zoom poll for our next round of Two Truths and a Lie. All right. So option number one. Hannah competed in axe throwing as a collegiate sport. I didn't even know that existed. That's pretty cool. Option number two, Hannah is learning to play the tenor saxophone. Or option number three, Hannah has a YouTube, had a YouTube video go viral in high school. She's a saxophone player, a YouTuber, or an axe thrower. You tell me. Well, as you can see, I guess the lie was that Hannah had a YouTube video go viral in high school. That would have been kind of cool if we had a, um, a YouTuber here too, but that's okay. We have an axe player and a tenor saxophone player. Hannah, would you like to tell us about um, the axe throwing? Because that seems kind of random, but also really cool. Yeah, unfortunately, my YouTube career never did take off, um, but I, while I was in school, um, I was a part of the UC Berkeley logging sports team and we did some a lot of axe throwing competitions. We used old school cross cut saws. Um, I did a lot of like chainsaw 
um, sports and basically you come together and you compete um, for time, for skill, and it's just a really good time, a lot of fun. Got to learn how to use equipment that I never thought I'd ever end up using in my life, but it's been, it was great. Do you say chainsaw sports? Yeah, like using chainsaws to do, um, yeah, who can cut, cut a piece of wood the fastest or things like that, a lot of fun. Well, that's really interesting. Awesome. So now I'll let you give your presentation if you guys want to continue with slideshow. Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen here. And can folks see this? Looks good. Looks good. Great. Awesome. Well, um, thank you so much, Evan, for the introduction. Um, like you said, my name is Hannah Lopez. And I'm the logistics manager for the Fire Forward program of Audubon Canyon Ranch. Um, I just want to give a huge thank you to all the folks um, who work to put this on tonight. And I'm just really, really excited to be here and um, to have the opportunity to kind of share my, my path and my career journey with you all. Um, so I thought the way I could structure this was first kind of talk about what my job is, what I currently do, and kind of how I got here. Um, so like I mentioned, I work for Fire Forward Audubon Canyon Ranch. Um, I am a part of a team of four people, and that's us there in the, the top photo. Uh, Audubon Canyon Ranch is a nonprofit land stewardship organization in the North Bay of California. Uh, we do education, stewardship, and outreach uh, across multiple preserves that Audubon Canyon Ranch holds. Um, Fire Forward specifically, our program, um, the mission is to expand prescribed fire capacities in the North Bay. So uh, we do that through a lot of different ways. Um, our on the ground work is mainly focused in Sonoma and Marin counties, but we really do support prescribed fire training and implementation all over California and even the United States. Um, to, to you know, meet that mission of building ecosystem and community resilience through prescribed fire or controlled burns, we do a, a number of things. Um, first, we support a local community-led prescribed burn association. It's called the Good Fire Alliance. Uh, fire Forward helps organize events. We offer trainings and workshops. And we also support other local burns that are hosted by other organizations in our area. Uh, we also work with private landowners are interested in implementing prescribed fire on their own lands. We help them develop burn units and do that implementation of treatments on their own properties. So Fire Forward also this year has launched both our internship program and our fellowship program. The internship program is um, supported by the Santa Rosa Junior College and our fellowship program partners with local organizations and other Good Fire Lines community members um, who want to increase their prescribed fire um, capacities and training. So we take folks um, from the, implement, the planning stages to the actual implementation of prescribed fire in their own communities and in their own organizations. Um, so kind of between all these aspects of the work that we do, an average day for me is pretty much, is pretty all over the place. You know, it can look something like this, where we're teaching wildfire courses in our Petaluma warehouse. It can look something like this, where we're actually doing on the ground um, prescribed burning and prescribed burning implementation. It can look something like this, where we're doing some coastal prairie restoration by removing uh, Douglas firs that are encroaching in the area through chainsaw work. Um, and it can also like most of us these days can look a little something like this, doing a lot of Zoom work um, and yeah, office work as well. So that's kind of where I'm at today. And I'll talk a little bit now about how I got here and what my background is. So I was born in Long Beach, California, in Southern California, and I moved up to Humboldt County, so Northern California when I was in middle school. So I went from like a very, very urban environment to a really rural area. And I really think that that transition for me so young um, really got me thinking about how I interact with the natural world, what my place is in the natural world and kind of what that means to me. And what it ended up meaning to me was that when I graduated high school, I knew that I wanted to study environmental science. Um, and so that's when I was applying for colleges, I applied for environmental science programs. 
So after graduating um, high school, I went to UC Berkeley. I got my undergraduate degree in forestry. I also got a minor in geospatial information science and technology, which is kind of a fancy way to say um, digital mapping and data sciences. However, when I uh, first was accepted to UC Berkeley, I was actually accepted in their environmental science program, not their forestry program. But before I actually started taking classes, I started looking at the required coursework for environmental science. And what I saw was a lot of physics, a lot of chemistry, and a lot of math. And that was very daunting to me. So I thought to myself, you know, maybe I should take a look at what the other majors are. <laughs> I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew that I wanted to be outside and that I learned best in really hands-on um, environments. So that's how I ended up finding the forestry major. What really attracted me to the UC Berkeley forestry major is that it has an eight week field program in the summer that's a required coursework. Um, a lot of their other required courseworks have this field component to them. Granted, I did end up having to take chemistry and math courses, but that field component really allowed me to stay engaged with my studies and with my program and um, yeah, kept me really engaged in the work that I was doing. So my first year of college, I think there were two things that really um, were important, but I'm really glad that I did. The first was that I joined the UC Berkeley Forestry Club, which is that picture on the left there. And the second was that I joined the UC Berkeley Logging Sports team. And being involved in these organizations just really helped me, you know, meet a lot of folks who were either further along in their forestry program at Berkeley or I graduated and were now professionals in the field. And these folks really ended up being my mentors and my close friends. They were the people that really encouraged me to apply for things that, you know, as a freshman, 18, 19, I really didn't feel confident to apply for, um, whether it was just confidence in my own abilities or um, not feeling like I had enough experience to do certain things. And I'm so glad that I had these folks in my life because um, when I had a friend who connected me with the UC Botanical Garden, and that's where I had a work study job all through college. Um, but more importantly, I had a group of folks who really encouraged me to apply for my first um, seasonal position. <clears throat> so after my freshman year, I worked for CAL FIRE at the Latour Demonstration State Forest. I was a forestry technician, so I got to do some forest inventory, some surveys. Um, I was doing timber marking, stream monitoring, um, you know, doing, setting up wildlife cameras, doing tree cone surveys, driving a truck in the woods for the first time, all that good stuff. Um, and I think without that encouragement from, from friends and folks in my program, I would have never applied for this job. And I'm so glad that I did because it really, um, gave me a lot to think about in terms of how I want to work in environmental fields and really solidified for me the fact that working outdoors just made me feel super fulfilled and super happy and that's where I wanted to be. So that was my freshman year of college. Um, at the end of my sophomore year, I went to the UC Berkeley Forestry Camp, which is that eight-week program I was talking to you about. Um, living in the Sierra Nevadas. And that's really where I started to learn more about fire science and fire ecology. I just completely fell in love with the field. Um, starting my junior year, I started working on a fire science laboratory on campus. Um, I was doing dendrochronology and fire history research. So dendrochronology is basically using tree rings to date trees. Um, figure out what their ages are. And from that information, we can also figure out you know, whether a tree experienced fire in its lifetime. And because we've dated the tree, we can also date those fires. So by dating that information, we can begin to have a better understanding of the fire history of an area, how an area experienced fire over time. Um, so that's kind of what these two pictures on the left are. The first one with that piece of paper on it is a sample that I worked with um, for a good year, almost dating all these fire scars and figuring out how old this tree was, which I think it ended up being like, I think almost like 200 years old. Um, and that second photo that's a little square at the top is a up close photo of what one of those fire scars look like and what tree rings look like under a microscope. 
So that's some of the research I was doing in the uh, fire science laboratory. I was also uh, in that lab working with the California Fire Science Consortium. I was doing a lot of science communication work, um, basically, you know, taking scientific papers and finding the uh, management implement implications in them and writing syntheses and write, writing briefs so that land managers could read um, the things that we wrote and say, okay, here's the actual management impl implications for this research. So a lot of uh, science commu communication things that I really enjoyed. So that was all my junior year, started working in the lab. And all the while, you know, I was still taking my coursework and I, through my courses and through being involved in the UC Berkeley Forestry Club, I got to have multiple opportunities to go up into the Sierra Nevadas at the Blodgett Forest Research Station, which is in El Dorado County. And I got to do my first prescribed burns. And oh my gosh, were they so cool. They were, they just blew my mind that I could be involved in something like this. And I would basically, any chance that I had to get up to Blodgett and do some burns, I took it. Um, whether it was, you know, uh, in my courses or making sure that I, you know, had a friend who had a car who was going up and I, you know, got a ride from them and just wanted to be there, wanted to be in the forest, wanted to be burning. So those are a couple photos. This, these bottom two photos are at the first prescribed burns I was doing. Um, yeah, so also budget for me is just also like a really special place. I ended up working there after my junior year of college. Um, I again was working a forestry technician job, doing a lot of forest inventory work, um, but this time in more of a research um, aspect, research component, kind of looking at the um, effects of the prescribed fires that I was setting and burning in the school year. I spent my summer kind of researching and taking data to understand what the effects of those fires were on the forest ecosystem. So I kind of had this pattern, right, of doing research, doing my coursework during the school year, during the semesters, and I spent my summers in the field. And um, that's, that's the time that I really found to, that made me happy, the, the field work. You know, I, those summers I really began to look forward to. And I, that's where I, I felt like I was most passionate about, or what I was most passionate about. However, all the while, you know, I'm taking courses for my degree. Um, and part of those courses was GIS classes. So my minor is, was in uh, geospatial information systems or computer mapping. And the more I studied and the more I took GIS courses, you know, the more I began to develop an appreciation for GIS as a tool to help us understand the distribution of environmental phenomena and figuring out how we can use mapping to become better land stewards. Um, I'm also just in general, like a big map nerd and I do love data science. So that kind of like um, really pulled me into that field. So again, as I started taking more and more classes in GIS, the more I really felt like I wanted to develop my GIS skills, wanted to be more involved in data science. And even though I really loved fire and forestry man forest management, I started to feel like I wanted to turn GIS into my actual career. So um, my senior year of school, I started working as an intern for a lab on campus that runs the informatics and GIS program of UC Ag and Natural Resources. It's also called IGIS. Um, super great experience. I got to work on a bunch of different projects. Um, some of them was you know, you know, mapping creek beds with drones, which is this photo here. Um, I was working on web maps. I was mapping broadband internet access in California to understand equity um, around internet access. And I was even, I got to develop some workshops to teach other people how to use these GIS softwares. Just a lot, a lot of fun stuff. And after I graduated, I did have the opportunity to continue to work for IGIS. I absolutely love the program. I gained really great experience um, and just, yeah, it was a great team and learned a ton. However, you know, the more I started working only on a computer, the more I realized that I really, really missed that outdoor component of my work. I missed being on the ground. I also missed working more with community members. 
So I did make a transition. You know, I, I felt like I wanted to be back in the field, uh, back in forestry and fire specifically. So I began working in split position at the Alameda and Contra Costa Resource Conservation Districts as a fire specialist. Um, while I was with the RCDs, I was supporting um, a project that's called the Regional Priority Plan. The Regional Priority Plan really is kind of a wildfire mitigation plan for natural resources. Its goal is to develop a list of projects that can be implemented in Contra Costa and Alameda counties that protect natural resources from the more negative impacts of high severity wildfire and allows us to build, I guess, resilient ecosystems that are um, resilient to fire. So this position was great for me because I was able to apply both my fire knowledge and a lot of my GIS skills. I did a lot of fire modeling and digital data visualization um, across both East Bay counties. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I also got to do a little bit community engagement. I hosted webinars on like fire safety and home hardening. I also did some outreach stuff for Earth Day. It was a great time. And that was the position that I held before I came to Audubon Canyon Ranch. So in May of 2021, I applied for the current position that I'm in now. And I started my job this past July. So I've only been here about six months, but I could just say that um, transitioning to this job has just been such an amazing transition for me. Uh, my position is a absolutely incredible mix of on the ground implementation, community building, teaching, learning with others, and even doing some GIS management for our program. So I work with really incredible people and along with the folks that I work with, I just really care about the mission of my work. Um, you know, prescribed burning was something that I would do for fun even, and it still is like a, a great time for me. Um, it's fire issues in California. If you ask me to speak on them, you can tell I'm just really passionate about it. Um, so it is something I care about. And then also finally, you know, I am a student of fire. I am constantly learning and growing from really, really incredibly knowledgeable professionals in my field. So my position is one that allows me to continue to grow as a fire practitioner myself and continue to learn. So just overall, my position is a great fit for me. It's what I'm passionate about. And, you know, um, I was thinking if I could offer some advice to folks, there are two major things I would say. The first is to really keep connections with folks, you know, with your mentors, with the colleagues, with your professors, all the folks that you meet in, you know, in school, in your jobs, in your internships, the folks that you become friends with. Because for me, you know, having community and having people that you trust to talk to, to bounce ideas off of, and to give you career advice is just really, really important. Um, personally, I identify as a member of the BIPOC community. And when I was younger, it was also like pretty difficult sometimes for me to see where I fit in with my field. And luckily, I just had some really great mentors, friends, and colleagues from all different periods of my life who are always able to support me. And, you know, even though these folks might not identify the same way I do, I know that I'm able to trust them and to give me like great advice when it's important to me and when I need it. So just keeping those connections is so important, um, I, I believe. So the other, the second thing that I would say is um, I'd like to encourage folks to always look at silver linings of all the work that you do. I really think that there is something to learn no matter where you are in your career um, and no matter where you're at. So even if you feel like your interests might be pulling you in a new direction, I think there's always something to learn from where you are in the moment. And there's ways to even learn uh, or to use what you've learned to help you uh, kind of, I guess, use it as a stepping stone to get into the direction that you want to go. So yeah, just always be learning, be open, be receptive to the lessons that you can take with you. Um, and I think that is everything that I have for you guys today. Um, I just wanna say a big thank you if you are interested in learning more about Audubon Canyon Ranch, our programs or Fire Forward, um, just visit our website, working around Instagram and Facebook. And of course, feel free to, to reach out to me as well. Um, yeah, a huge thank you to everybody, and it's great to, to chat with you all.
All right. I thought it was Q&A time. Let's go. This is one of my favorite parts because you guys in the audience will get to ask any question within reason, of course, to either one of the panelists. And you get to learn all about their career once again after that amazing presentation by Hannah. Thank you very much, Hannah. That was really good. I really liked hearing all about like your stay at UC Berkeley and getting to know all about fires and trees and that it's incredible. Your story is incredible. Now we are going to get to learn a little bit about both of you. Our first question has actually already been answered by the amazing Sarah Phillips, but Sarah, I was wondering if you could just summarize this answer you gave to Tati really quick. Tati asked, how do you balance life slash take care of your emotional health while dedicating your life to your passion? Yeah, uh, that's a big one. That didn't come for me until later in life. I was burning on all ends and working easily like 70 hour weeks and volunteering on the weekends and I loved it. But a time does come where you realize uh, you really need to step back and make sure you're taking care of yourself and you're prioritizing yourself so that you can continue to pursue your career and continue continue to follow you know what makes you happy with the work that you do so really paying it like learning yourself and getting to know yourself and seeing what outside of work brings you joy and doing that and for me personally it's you know it's traveling abroad it's going running it's practicing yoga yoga really helps um, center me running really helps ground me and traveling abroad really challenges me and uh, ultimately empowers me and I get to meet really cool people and it just kind of keeps my brain my brain juices going and being creative so it's just really important to set aside that time and if and if you can't go trail I know there's all these limitations around those things so like at the very least find a bathtub and some bubbles and soak light a candle and just chill out find a good book but just make sure you're having some time out time for yourself and nurturing yourself Yeah, um, I totally agree with with everything Sarah said, and I kind of touch on this as well. Um, for me, having connections with other people in my community, with my friends, is so important. Um, you know, having people that I can decompress with, and um, folks that sometimes it's kind of nice for me to to hang out also with folks that aren't so tied to fire too, because it's like I need to to not think about this for a little bit. Um, let's just talk about I don't know whatever we watched on Netflix or things like that. Um, so I think everybody has their own things that we like to do to decompress. And I think it's just like Sarah said, making time for those things that are important and um, yeah, making sure you're taking care of your mental health um, is, is really important. If you have folks you can talk to, all of that good stuff is, is crucial. Awesome, thank you. And this one is for both panelists. This person asked, what is your quick take on climate change and what do you think is the big thing that will get people to take action? Because I think that's what we need in this stage right now. We need people to take action. So what do you think is the big thing that will take that will make people take action? That goes out to both. Hannah, do you want to go ahead? Because I went ahead and wrote an answer in there. It's daunting. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess I can talk about this maybe from a fire perspective. Um, I think over the past, you know, 10 years or so, we've all experienced um, fire in California and some sometimes in really traumatic and devastating ways. And I think the things that I've seen is, um, especially from the work that we do, is seeing a community come together to take action in their own backyards and in their own areas to to make a change. And part of that is um, building community, building trust with each other and building back a healthier relationship with fire so that we can use good fire to, um, to steward our ecosystems and make our communities and our ecosystems resilient to high severity wildfire. Um, or, yeah, and I guess what, what I see when, when I work with our communities isn't, um, I guess, uh, pessimism it's more of hope that you know when when we work together we can achieve some really important and in incredible work um, so I think it it's important to hold on to that that hope that um, we're putting our best foot forward I guess um, in that way yeah
That is fantastic. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, Sarah, you want to summarize some of your thoughts that you've already written down? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, what's, what's more tangible for me is like, when I look at it in a global perspective, it is overwhelming, it is really daunting, and it makes my head spin. There's just, there's so much going on, and there's so much need out there, and so much change that needs to happen, like, yesterday. Right. <laughs> and it's still not happening today, but slowly but surely, you know, when you are really staying up to date, which is what I really like about conferences I miss conferences being in person. So you really get to have these dialogues, even outside of the presentation setting, but hearing what is being done and like how people are actually combating uh, climate change in their local communities provides hope. And that hope really helps inspire you to keep fighting the fight and taking it down to a more local level instead of the really broad global perspective and seeing what can you do at home in your neighborhood, in your town, in your county, in your state and plugging in um, starts feeling a lot more tangible. And um, with my line of work, you know, working with endangered fish and droughts, you know, it's really looking at the big picture of how can we, how can I in my job focus more on getting people to focus on water conservation and how can I allow more in-stream flows in the creek for summertime so we don't have fish dying and um, drying up in pools where we don't have in-stream flows. So different things with pulling people off of wells and having them harvest their rainwater and using rainwater instead to irrigate their landscape is one idea. Gray water systems and installing those is another one. And, you know, gosh, I can't wait till we get to the day that we're not using clean drinkable water to flush our waste. I mean, there's just a lot of different ways that we can be a little bit, a little bit more thoughtful and forward thinking um, and addressing the different aspects and impacts that we're seeing with climate change. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, Sarah. All right, we've got our next question. This is directly for Sarah Phillips. Sarah, what was your experience at Sonoma State and why are you glad you chose this college over others? Did the environment to feel too competitive or overwhelming at any point? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not gonna lie, since I mentioned, sorry, it's like really windy <laughs> where I'm at in the cloud force. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I was moving around as pretty nomadic uh, in my earlier time in California. And I was trying to think, where could I sit still for long enough to finish uh, school and transfer all my credits over from Kennesaw State? And I loved Sonoma State for a million reasons. It just, it felt like home more than anywhere else I've ever lived. So I started, that was what had me looking at Sonoma State. And then specifically when I saw that not only did they have environmental studies and planning program, but that they had a specific focus in restoration and conservation. That was what really was, was it for me because I knew it would be making a difference and it would be hands-on and I wouldn't be stuck inside in front of a screen all the time. Although I will say the longer you stay in your career and the more you move up a ladder, you do tend to be stuck at your desk more, um, but that's okay because you get better benefits and better money. So there's, there's a trade-off there, but that was why I chose that school and it just, it felt right. And they had a steelhead bearing stream actually on the campus. So it was really fun learning about riparian restoration um, right there, like hands-on on the campus. Awesome, thank you. And um, this one, I suppose you got to uh, both panelists. This person said in the, in the question section, I just graduated in December. In the last two years, we're on Zoom and most of the projects we did were not hands-on. Um, they weren't able to get an internship, and while they were in school, or well, and they're now applying to um, entry level jobs and internships that take recent graduates. And how do they make themselves hireable with such a limited experience, especially given the pandemic? Or some advice for that? I'll let, oh, sorry. I was going to say, Hannah, go for it because I, I wrote mine and I can summarize if need be after Hannah goes, but I would love to hear her thoughts on that. Yeah, I really feel for you. I graduated in May of 2020. So my last semester in college was on Zoom as well. Um, and I definitely feel the how, how difficult that, that time is. Um, I guess one thing that I would recommend is take a look at all the work that you did when you were on Zoom. And I think you can find some really valuable things that you did during that time. Um, and if there are things that you feel like you see opportunities now to expand on and continue to work on those skills or um, 
see how those experiences to continue to do that. Sometimes it's hard to feel like you're you're leveraging projects you did in school, like on interns' resumes and things like that. Um, but they're important. You know, you you did that work and um, you did build skills while you were completing those projects. And I wouldn't discredit those experiences. Um, I think Sarah said this in her her answer that you know, that hoping that employers will keep the situations that you were in in mind when they hire. And I, I would echo that as well. Um, and I guess I would also just encourage you to, to apply. Don't, don't feel like you can't apply for something just because you don't check maybe every single box all the way. Um, there's way to, to leverage experiences and, and things like that to, to make yourself, I guess, um, use the word hireable. Um, yeah, so so just, yeah, put yourself out there, I think, and apply for things and you'll be surprised. I think also a lot of it comes down to how you interview. So definitely practice your interview questions beforehand, come up with a list and, um, you know, speak them over with a friend. Um, there's a lot of resources online to like see sample questions. So I think coming to interviews prepared is like really, really crucial. Yeah, if I were to just summarize what I had said, it was, as Hannah had pointed out, I, if I were hiring somebody uh, and I were in this position, I would be definitely taking that into account. You know, I, I can't hold it against you that you've been taking school virtually and graduating during a pandemic and not being able to get experience. I mean, if anything, you know, not having the hands-on experience also means that you've been following the rules uh, as far as dealing with a pandemic and really trying to be really safe and, um, and not being in very public spaces. But before Omicron hit, there were some workshops starting to happen again and events happening. At least I noticed that in Marin and I was being really cautious because I used to organize a lot of hands-on trainings and workshops and lecture series all the time. And I just, I hit pause because I am a little bit of a germaphobe. And also I'm just really cautious because a lot of the population in Marin, um, they're older. And so I just didn't really want to put them in that position. However, I have a feeling that, you know, like I said, other organizations were going ahead and, and doing stuff. So, and then Omicron hit, everything went, but I believe once we start seeing that descending again and feeling safe again, that we will start having opportunities for, for hands-on. And you can feel free to reach out to me via email. Uh, so when I do start doing workshops and trainings again, I will put you on my list to let you know, but there should be some stuff coming up hopefully in the near future. But again, employers should be keeping that in mind and as Hannah mentioned, just finding other ways to leverage experience that you've had and, um, and practicing, practicing, practicing for interview questions and how you're going to answer them. Well, thank you. That sounds very reassuring. All right. Now for both of you guys, do you guys see a lot of overlap between environmental fields? Like is marine sciences, will, is that like a small field? Will you get stuck there? Will you get stuck in the same thing for you, Hannah? Like in your field, do you feel like you'll get stuck there at any point? Sarah, do you wanna go first? I figured I was just talking a bunch. I, I'm happy for you to go and I'll chime in. Great. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by stuck, but uh, for me personally, I would be happy to be stuck in this field. Um, <laughs> I think actually, I just think that there's so much to learn. Um, there's so much room for me to grow as a fire practitioner. Um, there's so much for me to, I think, contribute to and engage with different communities in different ways. Um, that I think I look forward to kind of where my career is going to take me. It, the fire world is pretty small, you know, folks that I work with, um, no folks that I worked with in my last job. And so it is, it is a small field, um, but sometimes that can be nice um, because you do feel like you have this kind of close-knit community and a lot of support in different ways. Um, yeah, hope that answers that question. Yeah, and I would say as far as in marine sciences, like, I get it, you don't want to be like pigeonholed. And um, Hannah, Hannah played it really smart with doing 
uh, a, a side degree in GIS and the geographic information systems. I remember when I was at Sonoma State, my advisor was like, unless you really want to be like in front of a screen doing mapping all the time, be careful about what you put in your resume. And like, if that's what you want to geek out on and you love it, which I like, Hannah, I applaud you. Like we need like GIS specialists so bad. Like I count on GIS specialists. I, I used to be pretty savvy. And then I had an assistant that was a geography major. And if you don't use it, you lose it. That's such a great skill to have. Um, but I did not want to be quote unquote stuck or pigeonholed. I'm doing GIS work all the time. And so I feel, I feel for you with marine sciences. However, I mean, when you think about marine sciences, the ocean, right? I mean, it's so vast. There's like species that are like haven't even been discovered yet. So kind of depending on where you're working at within the marine system. Um, I work with salmon and I, I work with them in their freshwater life stages. However, there is a connection with the marine aspect. And I, I wish I knew more about, you know, what they're doing out in the ocean, where they're going and what's going on. Um, there's more science around, around that. But I'd say just because you have a degree in marine biology and you pursue that, picking up internships and side jobs and other opportunities to just continue learning outside of marine biology will give you that opportunity. So if you graduate with marine biology, but you start having experience doing other things, maybe you want to go in a different direction so you don't feel stuck. But maybe you feel the way Hannah does about fire and you're like stuck. Like, what does that even mean? I'm stoked, which is how I feel about doing like watershed restoration stuff. Awesome. Thank you both. So I actually really like this question. And I know, Sarah, I believe you mentioned you used to work with um, social justice. And it said, this question was, did any of your jobs include input from Native Americans or awareness on Indigenous practices? Um, Sarah just went, so I'll have Hannah go. Yeah, I think it's always important to acknowledge that fire is a tool that's been used um, by Indigenous peoples for time and memorial. Um, it is something that we work to include Indigenous and Native voices in our work. Um, I, Audubon Canyon Ranch and Fire Forward is working on building relationships and strengthening our relationships with local tribes in our area um, to make sure that Indigenous leaders are at the table and um, are burning with us um, because their involvement is crucial and important and absolutely needed um, in our field. So um, I would say, sorry, let me reread the question one more time. I'm sorry, I can't find it. Could you repeat it? Yeah, uh, all good. It said, did any of your jobs include input from Native Americans or awareness on indigenous practices? Um, so I, I think, yes, yeah. uh, absolutely. That's good to hear. And Sarah, you, Sarah, you can go now. Sure, thank you, Evan. Um, so yeah, various jobs, depending on uh, which indigenous people that I'm working with. So up in, when I was working in the Yuba River, it was the Nisanan Maidu and the Chayaka Maidu tribes. And there were ceremonies called Calling Back the Salmon. And so that was with uh, when the Chinook salmon were coming back as adults and they've done their whole, all of their various life stages, right? And they're coming back and they're calling them back for spawning, which was a very touching and amazing ceremony um, to be a part of. And working in Marin, we're actually um, working on the lands of Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok uh, landscapes. And we do work with them beyond. So just also to add with the projects and being a special district of the state and um, working with public money and grant money, you are required by the state for California Environmental Quality Act, uh, AB 52, Assembly Bill 52, to be consulting with the tribes. So we like to go above and beyond what's just required by um, environmental law and actually go out of our way to meet with the tribes. Um, Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria are very well organized and the Coast Miwok Tribal Council in Marin also are pretty well organized. So we work with them to have them come out onto the landscape, be cultural monitors and let them know what projects we're doing and hear their feedback and see any way that we can work together and collaborate. So it's, it's very important to us. So in short, yes. Very nice, thank you guys. All right, next question, this is for Hannah. Hannah, 
you said that you changed your major from environmental science to forestry. And is that a difficult transition to switch majors, but still keep in an environmental degree? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think in terms of majors, um, a lot of the coursework, especially the lower division coursework, when you're first starting out in your career can have a lot of overlap. I think I kind of mentioned I was trying to avoid, you know, hard science, um, you know, chemistry and math. And I ended up taking those courses anyways, um, because there is overlap and there's a base foundation that you need before you kind of get into your specialization. Um, I would also say that for me, and also in terms of career, Sarah kind of mentioned this earlier, but by having GIS skills, um, GIS is like a very broad topic. And there's a lot of things that you can do with data science um, that's applicable in a lot of different fields. And you'll find that with other courses that you take, right? Things you learn in this one course um, might be applicable to environmental science in a very specific way, but are also applicable to forestry in another way. So um, skills like GIS kind of allowed me to transition in terms of even careers from one to another um, because I had that base level, um, I guess, skill set. And I would say the same for coursework, um, you kind of have a space level understanding that allows you to, to move between majors. Um, and I know it can be a little bit difficult, right, to, to figure out what you want to study. Um, and I would encourage you to, yeah, talk to folks that are further along in their majors if, if there's a way for you to connect with people in kind of their upper division courses and to talk with your, your school counselors to kind of see what those courses are geared towards and what careers might be, um, you might pursue after getting your degree in that major. Awesome. Thank you. So this one was a desired question to be answered. It says, given how both of you mentioned that your careers involve work behind a computer, as well as work on the field, obviously, especially right now during Zoom time, would you encourage people considering uh, pursuing careers in environmental science or studies to study programming or scripting languages like R, Python, or JavaScript? Uh, Sarah, go first, I guess. I'll be short. I am not, I am like a technologically challenged individual. I like, I didn't grow up with computers. I didn't, I grew up with a pager. We didn't have cell phones. I am like the old people that are like struggling with these kind of things. So uh, the thought of programming is very intimidating. That being said, yeah, there's like, there's definitely a niche to be filled there. And if you can handle sitting in front of the screen um, for long amounts of time, I say go for it and, and be able to fill that niche. And also it, it pays pretty well and has good benefits too. In terms of programming languages, um, in my experience, R is the language of the natural resources world. So if you are gonna focus on one, I would say focus on R. Um, it's also an open source software. So anyone can download those programs onto your computer. And if you're interested in programming, I would say download it um, and start. I think you can find resources online, you know, um, whether it's like YouTube or probably just Google searches, you can find tutorials, data to download, data sets to, to uh, play around with and just start, start seeing what you can do. Um, if you're going into GIS, um, I would say having an understanding of programming is really important. Um, it's not crucial. I did take some data science courses that taught me, um, I think, some Python um, because some of the GIS programs, like if you're using ArcGIS, if folks are familiar with programs, ArcGIS and ArcPro use Python as a base coding language. Um, so having some understanding of what Python scripts do can help you troubleshoot things if you're getting really into the nitty gritty and things like that. Um, again, it depends on what you want. Sarah kind of mentioned that if people see that you have GIS on your resume, they might like immediately shoot you into that GIS position. You might not totally want that, um, but it is again, a skill that people have a need for and they want in their workplaces. So I wouldn't say that, I would say that it is a good, um, good idea to, to at least try and, and see if you like it. Um, it's not for everybody and, and that's that's just what it is um, 
but yeah, also I would just say that a lot of uh, computer language programming stuff, if you have questions about it, can be Google searched. Um, I think the best piece of advice that I ever got uh, while I was doing um, programming and um, like language was that the best programmers know how to Google search. It's not about immediately knowing the answer. It's about knowing what you need to type into Google to, <laughs> to answer your questions. And I have found that to be true. Thank you very much. All right, next question we have is from an anonymous attendee. Sarah, something I've been curious about for a while is if any of these small streams in Contra Costa and Marin flow out to the bay, used to have Andron, I'm sorry, I do not know how to pronounce that, Salvanoid yeah. runs. Sarah, and if you can pronounce that, go ahead and read it off the question. Yeah, um, let me go back to the question. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. I saw it and I got excited. So um, Sarah, something I've been curious about for a while is if any of these small streams in Contra Costa and Marin that flow out to the Bay used to support, I'm assuming is the verb that would be there, anadromous salmonid runs. Um, so anadromous means uh, both, uh, I, I relate to fish, of course, when I think of anadromy and it's the ability for it to, the fish to transition between freshwater and saltwater and um, in the case of steelhead trout, which are in the Salmonidae family, I'm not going to geek out on phylogenies and taxonomy with you, but I could. Uh, they are they are related, but they actually can go back and forth, and so they can, you know, they're they're born in the freshwater, they go out to the saltwater, and then they come back and they spawn, and they can choose to actually go back out to uh, the ocean. They can also choose to stay in the freshwater, at which point we then call them rainbow trout. But a rainbow trout, steelhead trout same species, Oncorhynchus mycus. Um, it's just uh, a matter of whether they're staying and living out their full life cycle in freshwater, if they're choosing to go. Sometimes they don't have a choice though. Sometimes we have dams and that cuts off the habitat and they're stuck upstream of the dam. To answer the question though, yeah, they still actually do have anadromous fish uh, going through there. And the reason I was focusing on steelhead trout, rainbow trout is because those streams still do support. Uh, I use support loosely because there aren't large populations of them. Um, but in Marin and coming into the Bay Area, we do have steelhead trout. Um, this year specifically, or I guess last year at the end of the year, uh, we had a lot of Chinook salmon. Uh, they were strays. It's one of the salmonid species that tends to stray the most. And they were coming in all types of different watersheds they hadn't been seen in a long time. And then when you also think of coming in um, through the San Joaquin Delta and going in through the, the Delta and Sacramento. Those are Chinook, we have Steelhead, um, Coho or coastal watershed. So you don't see Coho in that area, but they used to come in to Marin and to the Bay draining watersheds. But uh, once some entities started concrete lining the channels and the creeks, that's about when we stopped seeing Coho salmon coming in. Steelhead trout tend to be a little more fierce. They can handle uh, faster, velocities of water and steeper uh, gradient slopes. So they've been able to hang in there, uh, but they're also federally protected as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. But right now actually is the time to get out there and see steelhead spawning. So um, it is steelhead season, just for the record. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. So we got two more questions left. We'll try to knock them out pretty quickly. Hannah, the first one's for you. What was covered in forestry class? I'm assuming that's in college. Uh, this person is thinking about studying it and is curious what will be covered. Yeah, um, forestry is a really wide field. Um, and I would say that you might wanna look at um, the courses that are offered in the, the I guess the school that you're you're doing your forestry major in. A lot of different schools have kind of different, um, I guess, tracks in forestry. Um, there are a lot of folks who go into forestry to become professional foresters. So that has to do a lot more with timber harvest and, you know, uh, timber production, uh, which is a really important thing in forestry. Um, you know, we do rely on timber products. Um, so it's kind of the science and the natural um, systems behind timber production. There's also ecological forestry. So people who are 
um, looking at managing forests primarily for ecological health. Um, there is the fire side of forestry where folks are you know, thinking about fire sciences, which is kind of where I am more and what I'm, I'm more involved in fire ecology, um, fire science and forestry, the role that fire has on the health of ecosystems and forests. Um, and there's also a lot of different, you know, I guess, types of forests, right? We have oak woodlands, we have urban forestry, we have, um, I guess, yeah, redwood forests, you know, Sierra Nevada, different ecosystems. So there is components of forestry, um, I think across all, all four aspects of forestry majors that is like understanding plants and learning plant ID, learning plant different names, um, learning like how trees grow, um, that kind of stuff. So all that kind of thing, those, those are the baseline knowledge that you get when you are going into a forestry major and then you kind of go into your specializations from there, kind of like, okay, how do we do timber harvests? Or how do we um, use prescribed fire to promote tree growth? Or how does fire even uh, you know, affect trees? How do trees affect watershed uh, health and all that? all that great stuff. Um, so I would also say that a lot of different schools have different concentrations for the forestry major that they offer. So take a look at the school that you're wanting to apply to, take a look at the classes that they offer and see if it feels like a good fit for you. Um, some schools are a little bit more geared towards, you know, uh, fire professionals or, you know, timber professionals. Things like that. Thank you very much, Hannah. All right, we've got one last question, this is for both of you. Would you encourage someone to, or even think it's necessary to pursue a master's or PhD in environmental science or studies? So that's a question I still ask myself at almost 40 years old. Um, so many times I have had opportunities to go to grad school and for whatever reason, something always happens. Like I end up getting the dream job that I apply for, or like I have to move or, you know, the school that has like the best program that I really want to get a master's in is not where I want to live. And I know that is so not important when you're looking at the, like your lifespan and your career. But for me, it's really important to, to be happy with where I live and that I'm where I want to be. Um, I think having a master, I think if you get a PhD, that's really, you're getting into like hardcore research uh, publications, uh, potentially being a professor, if that's something you're interested in. Um, you know, I think that's great. We really need and, and lean on folks that are very primarily focused on, you know, collecting the data, analyzing the data and writing up the results and having the science there for the practitioners to be able to lean on and to use and to guide our work and our actions. Um, I think a master's degree is, is great. I mean, back in the day, it wasn't so much you know, that important. And nowadays I feel like everybody has a master's degree, at least one master's degree. So, you know, it's, I would suggest uh, once you get your bachelor's, if you really know what you wanna be doing and you know environmental science is it, just, just keep going. Like, you know, just go ahead and like, get it out, bang it out of the way and have, and have your master's and then, and go from there. I will also just say with that caveat, not having a master's degree, has never ever kept me from any of my dreams. It's never kept me from any job that I've ever applied for that I wanted. It's, it hasn't gotten in the way for me, but that's just me personally. I know all the time I'm wanting to geek out and learn more. And, you know, I've gone back to school several times. I just didn't end up getting a graduate degree, but I probably should at this point from all the hours I've spent still, still going to school whenever I get a chance to take some classes. Yeah, um, I would agree with Sarah on the, the point, especially about PhDs, if you know you want to be in the research world, and if you really enjoy academia, um, I think a PhD is, is pretty, pretty crucial to, to staying in that um, kind of environment in that world. Um, in terms of master's, I do know a lot of folks who have gotten their master's degree and um, you know some jobs that I am reading as I read the, the job descriptions are either master's degree required or a strong preference to master's degrees. And that said, uh, I, I don't have a master's degree. Um, personally, I felt 
feel like I need some time between completing my undergraduate degree um, before I would even consider going back to school because I do think job experience um, is really important. And a lot of master's programs do look for actual on the ground job experience before you apply. They do like some, some programs really do value um, job experience over just going straight from undergrad into a master's program. So I would consider that when you're thinking about the field that you want to end up in or even the master's program that you want to apply to. Um, yeah, as, a, as just a personal thing, I, I think I eventually will go back to school to get um, probably a master's degree, but I don't, um, I don't feel like I am in a rush to do that. Um, I do think that it can be difficult to find jobs sometimes, I guess, um, without a master's degree, but I wouldn't discount the uh, importance of having job experience before you, um, you know, think I need to have a, a master's degree before I can get a job. That's not necessarily true. And uh, in my case has not been my experience. I would also also quickly oh, sorry. add. I'm you sorry, go. Evan, you didn't, you didn't see that coming. I just like, I had an extra thought on the fact of um, student loan and student debt and just making sure that, I mean, like I, it's not rocket science. Environmental science doesn't pay huge bucks, generally speaking. So just be cautious about, um, you know, what the tuition would look like and if you can actually join a professor and uh, be a research aide and find other ways to really make it affordable is, is important because there's nothing like finishing school, even undergrad, and just having that weight of having to pay off tuition. But yeah, experience is, is huge, as Hannah mentioned. That's at the end of the day, like jumping out of class doesn't necessarily get the job done. They want to make sure that you know what you're doing and you have experience with that. Awesome. Thank you. And with that, that uh, wraps up our Q&A session. And thank you very much to both of you. And now if we get the slideshow going, we have some additional information real quick. I'll actually start out with a book section. So here are some books, as you can see on the slideshow, that uh, Sarah Phillips recommended if you're, interesting, if you're interested in reading more about um, her, her profession. And so I'll give you guys some time to screenshot this slide if you guys want to. And here up here is a link tree if you guys are interested in learning more about Fire Forward and the Audubon uh, Canyon Ranch from Hannah. And also there's, a, uh, there's also information if you wanna learn more about the topics that Sarah covered. So yeah. And also I believe we have one more um, presentation from the library on their seed library. So go for it, Jacqueline. We are really be expanding our seed libraries. We had three in West County to start off with, and under the theme of sustainability, we are going to expand that in Antioch. We opened ours this month, and it's been really popular. We are hoping that people will come in and check out the seeds, and then eventually they'll start saving seeds and bringing them back, and that way we can get stuff that grows really well in our areas. For more information, check out our library of things that I'm putting into the chat feature, see all the great stuff we have available. Thanks. All right, that's about it. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, a big thank you to our panelists who are so very amazing, to everyone here who's a volunteer, all of these people are volunteers for the most part, if you're part of SLEA and if you're part of SCOCO. Ellie is here, we've got Jackie here, we've got, we've got everybody guys, this is amazing. Thank you to everyone. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. We have such a fun time scheduling these programs and all the work that comes into it that goes into it is definitely worth it. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the Climate Careers Chat intern, Mia, Kyle, Stella, Rachel, Alexi, Evan, Tati, Abigail, Sarah, and the rest of the team who've worked on this and contributed in one form or another. And thank you so much to the library for working on this program with us. We have so much, so much fun doing these events and thank you to our panelists. Um, for such great information and enthusiasm.